Hello and welcome back. Well, I'm Adriza, and um, welcome to the second section of the lectures on implicit memory storage. Well, uh, <clears throat> in the very first section, I uh, introduced habituation and sensitization. I talked about their molecular mechanisms. And in this lecture, which is the second lecture, uh, which is uh, the second section of those lectures on implicit memory, I'm going to talk about, actually elaborate on those uh, structural changes which happen in sensitization, both in sensitization and habituation. I'm also going to talk about the, uh, those mechanisms underlying the maintenance of LT LTF, or long-term facilitation in, in sensitization. And as I promised, I'm going to finally talk a little bit about classical conditioning. And this is the very first part of the section two, the structural changes in sensitization. Let's begin. Well, uh, before talking about the structural changes in sensitization, I want to elaborate um, on a, a very important uh, a concept in, in uh, neuroscience and in biology in general. Well, uh, we're all familiar, we are all familiar with this linear pathway from genes to, to, to structure and from structures to functions. It means that our genetic, our genome, our genes uh, determine the structure of our proteins, uh, cells and tissues and even the whole organs and the whole body. And the structure determines the function of, for example, a biomolecule. Well, this is the case for um, all of the organs in the body with one exception. And that exception is the brain. Well, our mysterious brains. Why the brain doesn't... Actually, brain follows this linear pathway in early stages of development, actually. So, uh, you know, our genes determine the structural connectivity or the structure of neuronal connectivity of our brains. And our, the, that structure determines the function of our brains. Well, what happens when we are born is that, well, we are bombarded with billions of external signals. And uh, as we grow up, we interact with our environments more and more. We learn new skills. We experience new things. And it turns out that the way we use our brains and the more we interact with our environments and the more we uh, keep something, keep different things in mind and trying to uh, the, the more we try to, you know, uh, <clears throat> put something in our long-term memories and the more we experience the world, the more we change the structure of our brains. And that is, you know, intriguing. That is wonderful, fascinating. You know, the way we use it, you know, it means that there is a loop connection from function back to the uh, structure. It means that the way we use the brain somehow changes the structure of our brains. You know, um, and actually this idea, uh, I first heard that from Dr. Uh, Jeff Lickman um, from Harvard, who's, uh, uh, you know, who's famous for his uh, project on, uh, you know, uh, his project uh, is called uh, Connectomics. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about him and uh, his projects um, in, uh, in the lecture series on explicit memories. But Dr. Lakeman, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you, uh, you all know him. Well, Dr. Lakeman, uh, I first heard this idea from him, and he's, he, he, um, he has a very particular example, very uh, simple example for it. Well, he says that imagine that you know, uh, imagine the very first time you want to learn how to ride a bicycle. Do we have a gene for the uh, for determining the structure, um, the structural connectivity in certain parts of our brains, uh, which are imp which are you know used for controlling our movements in uh, why we are riding a bicycle? No, we don't have such a gene. Actually, the name. Uh, the funny name um, that Dr. Lickman um, used was bicycling. We don't have a gene called bicycling. Uh, the structural connectivity 
which enables us to ride a bicycle doesn't exist in us. So we should learn, first we should learn how to ride a bicycle and somehow that learning changes the structure of our brains. And again, somehow by some mechanisms, that structural change stays with us to the end of our lives. And so, uh, you know, by experiencing, by uh, interacting, with, interacting with, the, with the environment, by uh, learning something new, we change the structure of our brains. And so this is the foundation of neuronal plasticity and the structural changes as a result of, um, you know, using the brain. And as, uh, as we saw in the previous lecture, uh, you know, I explained the uh, <clears throat> alterations in gene expression as, as a result of long-term fac uh, facilitation. We know that the function sometimes can have some effects on the genes and can change something about the gene expression as well. So, the, you know, brain follows this uh, linear pathway, but it's not always linear. There, we have some loops, okay? Um, about the brain, and this is a very fundamental concept in understanding how our brains work. I just wanted to uh, point it out um, before talking about structural changes in sensitization and habituation. Now let's talk about structural changes in long-term implicit memories. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. These are the number of synaptic, uh, you know, in this... Um, the y-axis is the number of uh, synaptic boutons per sensory neurons. And synaptic boutons are synaptic varicosities or synaptic terminals. And, you know, um, I don't want to uh, mess with the numbers. I don't want to mention the numbers. But, you know, by just taking a glimpse of it, you can see that in habituation we have, of course, less number of synap uh, uh, synaptic vesicles, uh, sorry, synaptic uh, varicosities or boutons uh, in sensory neurons. And in sensitized um, organisms, the number of synaptic protons in sensory neurons almost doubles. You know, you see, and this is a significant um, uh, structural change as a result of long-term sensitization. And here we have a schematic view of what, what is happening in long-term implicit memories. You know, in the control one, we have two of these synaptic boutons, you know, these swellings. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, or synaptic terminals on motor neurons. And we have, uh, in long-term habituation, we have one of them. You know, actually, one of these, you see, synaptic boutons is, you know, by one, I mean, uh, it's just uh, a number, but uh, some of these synaptic boutons um, are deleted. And the process, the deletion of synaptic contacts or detectable synaptic uh, connections is called synaptic pruning, actually. And so here we see synaptic pruning in long-term habituation. In short-term habituation, we don't have synaptic pruning. But in long-term habituation, we have uh, structural changes, of course. And in long-term sensitization, you see that the number of these synaptic boutons almost doubles. Okay, we have new synaptic uh, connections. And I, I explained the cellular and molecular mechanisms uh, that led to, uh, <clears throat> that leads to, uh, to the formation of these new synaptic connections, okay? So these are, you know, the structural changes in um, sensitization and habituation. Again, this is the, uh, you know, uh, I gathered this data from, uh, I didn't gather uh, the data myself, I actually got it from uh, a paper, uh, and these are, you know, experimental data, um, or data, uh, <clears throat> which prove, uh, proves the structural changes in long-term habituation and sensitization. You see that in the control animal, the number of active zones are, for example, in one animal, there are 17 active zones uh, between two cells, for example, and in another animal, there are 21. But in habituation, for example, in one cell, uh, in, in one animal, uh, when it is habituated, uh, we have eight, and in the other one we have five active zones. So we can see that the number of active zones in habituated animals uh, is decreased. And the number of uh, you know, active zones in a sensitized animal is increased, as we accept. 
uh, expected, actually. And here you can see the uh, number of vesicles associated with each active zone. Again, uh, we have, uh, for example, 13, uh, no, 13 vesicles associated with each active zone uh, in controlled animals. But in senses, uh, in habituated ones, we have less number of active uh, uh, vesicles. And in sensitized animals, we have uh, almost double, uh, uh, double of the amount that we have in controlled animals. And, uh, well, we saw, uh, you know, I actually explained it again in the previous lecture, that <clears throat> serotonin, which is used to applying to, to inducing long-term and short-term sensitization in aplasia, actually starts or initiates uh, signaling pathways in the terminal, axonal terminals of, of sensory neurons, uh, aplasia sensory neurons, and those uh, signal transduction cascades or pathways, they actually uh, recruit more synaptic vesicles to the active zone. Okay, and this is, this is the experimental data uh, proving that. And these are, this is the active zone of, uh, <coughs> of one of the sensory neurons, and this is, uh, I guess it is, of course, it should be an electron microscopy, uh, electro, electron uh, micrograph. The active zone is shown between these two arrowheads, and uh, the dye used here for taking this picture is horseradish uh, peroxidase, uh, the, the dye that uh, Professor McMahon also used for most of his studies, and I'm sure, I don't remember exactly, but I am sure that uh, in this paper, they used some of the uh, research projects done by Professor McMahon, and some of the papers written by Professor McMahon, but I don't exactly remember uh, uh, the title of those uh, papers, but I'm sure they used some of the research uh, papers uh, written and uh, you know, uh, conducted by Professor McMahon. And this is just uh, the uh, bar graph of, of the data you see here. There's a the number of vesicles associated with active zones. In habituated animals, we have very few number of uh, vesicles. In the active zone, in control one, we have, well, uh, uh, you know, a normal amount. And in sensi sensitized animals, we have, uh, you know, the number, of active, the number of vesicles associated with each active zone is doubled compared to the control animals. So these are again uh, experimental data uh, proving the uh, you know structural changes in long-term habituation and sensitization. Okay, so <coughs> this is I guess the last piece of evidence. Um, actually, this is not uh, structural. This is not, uh, you know, evidence for structural changes, but it's an evidence still for those electrophysiological and functional changes in uh, sensitized um, organisms or sensory neurons. And these are, well, uh, the processes of sensory neurons uh, which, contact, which are contacting the, the initial segment of motor neurons. And so we have two of these processes. Um, here, A and B are you know the same processes, um, but B is 24 hours after the experiment, after the uh, initial uh, setup. And C and D are again the same uh, sensory neurons, but D is 24 hours after the beginning of the experiment. You know A, uh, the sensory neuron processes in A are control processes, and those sensory neurons, sensory processes in C are treated with serotonin. And let's see what happens after 24 hours. Well, we wait 24 hours. In a control group, uh, nothing actually happens. We didn't apply serotonin. So when we measure the EPSB in the motor neurons and we compare it to, uh, to the EPSB in modern neurons 24 hours later, nothing happens. Same. Uh, but when we treat the uh, processes of sensory neurons and those uh, synapses with, uh, between sensory neurons and modern neurons with serotonin, and we measure the uh, 
we wait 24 hours and we measure the EPSP modern runs, we see that, uh, you know, the EPSP is increased because of the uh, application of serotonin. So this is another proof, experimental proof, for the concept of functional changes as a result of, um, uh, you know, uh, applying serotonin. But here you see, uh, I want to show you experimental proof for structural changes. What you see here is that <clears throat> this is a, a video micrograph of uh, a fluorescent, a fluorescent dyed uh, or labeled uh, sensory neuron. And these are the processes of sensory neurons, applied to sensory neurons. And this is a cultured sensory neuron. It's, it's not in vivo. But anyway, um, you can see that, you know, we apply serotonin again, like we did here in this experiment. We apply serotonin to these sensory neurons and to these processes, and we wait 24 hours. And we want to see uh, those uh, structural changes, those are structural changes in the outline region here uh, in these white blocks. So we wait 24 hours, and what we see is the presence of newly formed uh, synaptic varicosities. You can see that there are three very large, fully developed uh, varicosity, varicosities uh, indicated by these uh, large arrows. And we have two smaller ones indicated by these uh, smaller arrows. These, these are whether, you know, generally small varicosities or maybe they are not fully matured. Maybe they're not fully developed. But the point here is that after 24 hours, we have new varicosities and, and some structural changes as a result of the application of serotonin. It's beautiful, I guess. And is the, uh, no, Dr. Ken, yeah, Dr. Kendall actually uh, participated in these research projects. Most of the these lectures are based on the works uh, and research projects of Dr. Eric Kendall, actually. So, okay. That was, uh, well, <clears throat> I wanted to just show you the uh, experimental data and proof for structural changes in, in long-term implicit memories. Well, <clears throat> Um, scientists ask a very important and very interesting question about long-term facilitation, and they ask this question: that whether long-term facilitation is uh, synapse-specific or not. It means that well, when we uh, apply serotonin and induce long-term facilitation um, at one synapse of a sensory neuron, what happens at other synapses? Are they also facilitated as a result of that facilitation at, at, at an other synapse or not. <coughs> now let's see the experiments uh, for uh, related to this to this question. This is the, uh, the real photograph of the experimental setup we have. These are, you know, remember I told you that we have uh, very large uh, modern neurons in Aplysia. And these are modern neurons. They're gigantic. This is, uh, these are two L7 modern neurons. And there is a you know, smaller sensory neuron in between. And there is a <coughs> synapse between the sensory neuron and uh, these two uh, modern neurons. You know, this data just shows us the, 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 what I already showed you. Uh, you know, the increase in the level of EPSP as a result of applying, of the, you know, uh, serotonin. I don't want to focus on this part. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is the schematic diagram of, of this real photograph. So we have um, <coughs> a sensory neuron uh, forms a synapse with uh, modern neuron A. I want to call this synapse synapse A. And this synapse is between the sensory neuron and motor neuron B, I want to call it synapse B. And let's see what happens 
when we do some experiments, you know, first we apply one focal pulse of serotonin to the synapse A, representing one shock to the tail. And we know, as I told you in the previous lecture, one shock to the tail, you know, uh, <clears throat> induces uh, short-term sensitization. <coughs> and in this experiment, it does. You can see that this is the EPSB amplitude, and you can see that the <clears throat> amplitude of the EPSB um, is increased by 50%. And that increase in the amplitude of EPSB stays for 10 minutes, persists for, for 10 minutes. But after 10 minutes, after 24 hours, you know, it uh, turns back to its uh, normal level. Okay, so this is short-term uh, synaptic facilitation, of course. Uh, we didn't apply any serotonin to synapse B. It means, you know, the synapse from the sensory neuron, with, uh, between the sensory neuron and uh, motor neuron B. And so we don't see, we, we see nothing. We don't see any kind of uh, synaptic facilitation. Now let's see what happens when we induce long-term facilitation. We use five pulses of serotonin. Uh, <clears throat> and what happens is that we have a much larger increase in the amplitude of EPSB, and not very surprisingly, it stays for 24 hours. Because, you know, we used five pulses, and those five pulses induce uh, long-term sensitization. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. But again, <coughs> Uh, at the synapse with cell B, we see nothing, not even uh, short-term synaptic facilitation. So these two first experiments uh, prove that both long-term and short-term uh, sensitization or synaptic facilitations are synapse-specific. <coughs> but this is the, what happens next in the third experiment is what is, you know, so fascinating, so beautiful, so wonderful and intriguing. What happens is that scientists decided to pair five pulses of, sorry, my pointer just, you know, not working very properly, sorry for that. So, scientists decided to pair five pulses of serotonin <coughs> at one synapse, and only one pulse of serotonin at another synapse. And the result was surprising. Surprising. In cell A, well, we expect, uh, long, we expect to see long-term sensitization, and we see long-term sensitization. In, in the synapse B, we don't expect long-term sensitization because we, we just applied one pulse. Instead, we see long-term facilitation. What happened? <clears throat> we applied five pulses at synapse A, and we applied only one pulse at synapse B. How can one pulse induce long-term facilitation? The key is, is pairing these two <coughs> um, applications of serotonins together. When we pair these two, when we induce long-term synap uh, synaptic facilitation at one synapse, we all know that because it is long-term, it's going to, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> initiate uh, the transcription of a specific genes and, you know, uh, the synthesis of new proteins and mRNAs. And so some proteins are activated, uh, you know, uh, protein kinase A, of course, is activated at this synapse, okay, at which we are applying long-term sensitization, and that protein kinase travels back to the, uh, to the soma of the sensory neuron, and it uh, initiates the transcription of new uh, mRNAs and synthesis of new proteins, and those newly nuclear products, mRNA, newly synthesized mRNAs and proteins, they, they are uh, 
they travel back to the synapses, all of the synapses of the cell, by fast axonal transport, of course, and they stay there. But they're only functionally incorporated at those synapses which are tagged or marked by serotonin. So if serotonin doesn't exist at a synapse, is not applied to a synapse, <coughs> those <coughs> nuclear products, <coughs> sorry, those nuclear products are not functionally incorporated, so we don't see any long-term facilitation here. But here, this synapse is tagged or marked by serotonin. And that's how even one pulse, one single pulse of serotonin, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, uh, I don't know what is happening. Uh, that's why one pulse of serotonin is enough to induce long-term facilitation. And this phenomena is called the capture of long-term facilitation. And it's so beautiful. <coughs> this is a very important <coughs> um, concept, the capture of long-term facilitation. And in the next uh, section of this lecture, I'm going to explain the uh, molecular basis of, of this uh, phenomena, of this synaptic tagging or uh, capture of long-term sen uh, sensitization. So let's talk about <coughs> the maintenance of, of, uh, of long-term facilitation. The well, scientists asked, that, okay, what are the, uh, <clears throat> you know, what, what is required for maintaining those long-term synaptic changes? And they uh, already knew that, well, CAMP and protein kinase enzymes are important for inducing both, uh, they're involved both in uh, short-term and long-term synaptic, uh, synaptic facilitation and sensitization. So they did this experiment. <coughs> They also wanted to know the role of protein kinase A and protein synthesis in the capture of uh, long-term facilitation, in capturing the uh, long-term facilitation. What they did is that, well, <clears throat> they did the same experiment as we saw in the previous slide. They induced long-term facilitation at one synapse. They uh, applied one focal pulse of serotonin at another synapse. But here, <clears throat> they did one experiment in one of those experiments, they did two experiments actually. In one of those experiments, they inhibited protein kinase A. And in the another experiment, they inhibited local protein synthesis. This is the experimental data they got. <coughs> <coughs> they saw that, you know, when they wanted to capture they wanted to cause a synapse to capture synaptic plasticity, synaptic facilitation. The synapse requires protein kinase A for the capture, for the capturing of uh, synaptic facilitation. Because when they uh, inhibited uh, protein kinase A, <coughs> this is the EPSP amplitude again, you can see that the amplitude of EPSP uh, doesn't raise at all. It stays at the basal level. There's no change in EPSP when the protein kinase A is inhibited. So protein kinase A is definitely required for, for the initiation or the very first step of capturing uh, uh, <clears throat> long-term facilitation at a synapse. In another experiment, they didn't inhibit protein kinase A. But they inhibit uh, local protein syn synthesis by emitting. And they saw that, you know, they saw an increase in the, again, the EPSP amplitude after, you know, 24 hours. Okay? So the, the uh, <coughs> EPSP, the amplitude of EPSP increased uh, after 24 hours. 
And what does that mean? It means that, well, local protein synthesis is not required for the initial, uh, for initializing the uh, synaptic uh, facilitation. But after 24 hours, you can see the amplitude uh, doesn't stay, um, you know, and you know, you can see the amplitude of EPSP decreases. And after 72 hours, we see no increase in EPSP. And that means that maintaining the synaptic plasticity after 24 hours requires local protein th synthesis. So, these two experiments tell us that there are two distinct components of synaptic tagging or synaptic uh, uh, or capture of long-term facilitation. The first component, which is required for beginning that, uh, those the, 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 the structural changes and synaptic plasticity, is protein kinase A. So protein kinase A is, is crucial for the initial state of synaptic plasticity, for, for beginning the synaptic plasticity and those structural changes. And we have local protein synthesis as another component of synaptic tagging, which is required not for initializing the synaptic plasticity, but for maintaining those, uh, those structural changes, those long-term structural changes as a result of synaptic plasticity or facilitation. So we have two components. We have protein kinase A um, and local protein uh, synthesis. Oh, you know, I want to explain um, a very interesting type of uh, proteins called prions. <clears throat> or prions. I guess prions is the correct pronunciation. <clears throat> yes, prions. I want to explain prions. And, you know... Uh, you may say, why do I need to explain prions? Why do I want to explain prions? Well, it's about the next slide. I just want to introduce the concept of prions, and I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this in the next slide. <clears throat> and it's important for understanding the role of protein uh, synthesis, local protein synthesis at synaptic terminals uh, for, in, uh, in the uh, uh, capture of, of uh, long-term facilitation. So what are prions? Prions are uh, abnormal forms of uh, cellular proteins <clears throat> that are pathogenic. It means that they induce uh, diseases and disorders. So, um, you know, let me, let me show you the picture. So, a healthy form of prion, okay, the form, the conformation that um, <clears throat> has no uh, pathogenic uh, properties is this form. This one is called PRPC or cellular prion, uh, prion protein. And it is alpha helical. You can see that it has alpha helices. Somehow, uh, mostly because of, uh, you know, some genetic mutations and uh, contact, uh, via contact and physical interaction with pre-existed or pre-existing uh, prions, uh, pathogenic prions, it is converted to this conformation or conformational state. And in this state, it doesn't contain alpha helices anymore. It has beta sheets. And this conformation, which has beta sheets, is called PRPC, PRPCS, sorry, SC, sorry for that, PRPSC. It stands for Scrapey uh, prion protein. Scrapey is a, a, a prion disease in goats and sheep. Uh, and I think these uh, prions are first found in those in that in that disease. Okay, so uh, maybe they're that's why they're called uh, scrapey. Uh, 
But anyway, these are pathogenic. They form aggregates. And when they form aggregates, let me actually show you this. Okay, sorry. So we have the wild type, <clears throat> the uh, non-pathogenic type, PRPC. And this is uh, converted to this pathogenic form, PRPSC. This pathogenic form can convert other wild types and, um, you know, harmless and normal proteins to pathogenic ones through uh, physical interaction and physical contact. And they can attach to each other and form aggregates. And when they form aggregates, they cause neuronal toxicity. And they cause, uh, you know, this is the pathogenesis. This is how they cause uh, uh, diseases and disorders. So that was a very, very simple, uh, you know, superficial introduction to prions. Okay. Now I want to talk about, <clears throat> you know, the molecular mechanisms which are required for maintaining the long-term facilitation and the capture of long-term facilitation. I told you that, uh, <coughs> you know, capturing long-term facilitation at, the, at, at this synapse, okay, which we uh, just apply one focal pulse of serotonin, requires both, uh, you know, protein kinase A and local protein uh, synthesis. Protein kinase A, uh, is used for at the beginning of um, of synaptic uh, facilitation for initializing the synaptic uh, plasticity, but local protein th uh, synthesis <coughs> is required for maintaining the structural changes or long term changes after 24 hours or after 72 hours. Now let's see what happens at this synapse. I told you already that you know uh, when we. Uh, induce long-term facilitation here in the, at this synapse with, uh, with uh, modern neuron A, you know, some signals are sent uh, to the uh, soma and some new mRNAs and proteins are uh, <coughs> sent to the, sent back to the uh, synapses, okay, and, uh, but <coughs> those mRNAs or nuclear products are only functionally incorporated uh, into the synapse, uh, or at the synapse, uh, when we have serotonin. <clears throat> now let's see why serotonin is required for synaptic marking or synaptic tagging. So what is happening here is that we have some, uh, you know, some of those mRNAs which are trans uh, transferred to the synapses, to all of the synapses of a cell through fast axonal transport, uh, they encode a specific protein called CPIP. CPIP stands for cytoplasmic polyadenylation uh, element binding protein. And I'm going to explain why uh, it is called this protein. Well, what does this uh, CPIP do? <coughs> is that, well, CPIP actually um, exists in a cell in two forms. Uh, it, has an, it has an inactive conformation or form and it, is, and it, and it uh, exists as a, as a soluble monomer, okay, like these. And it is activated somehow by unknown mechanisms by serotonin and PI3 kinase or phosphoinositide 3 kinase. It is activated. Once it is activated, here is the reason that why I explained prions. Once it is activated in, the, in, its, in its active conformation, it acts like a prion. It contacts other monomers, soluble monomers, and it uh, <coughs> activates them as well. And again, like prions, they form aggregates. They form aggregates. And once they form aggregates, and they're in this active aggregated form, 
They can bind to a very specific site called cytoplasmic polyadenylation element site on dormant mRNAs. And this binding, you know, by binding to this site, these aggregates of CPEP, they recruit um, <clears throat> an enzyme called poly-A polymerase. A poly-A polymerase, elonga uh, you know, causes the elongation of poly-A tail. A poly-A tail is a, 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 a tail of adenine, adenine at the end of a dormant mRNA. And so when that tail exists, in, um, at, the, at, the, at the tail of the mRNA, that mRNA can be recognized by ribosomes, and, and thus it can be, uh, you know, uh, translated into uh, polypeptides and proteins, okay? So, what happens is that, you know, <clears throat> these uh, CPEP proteins are activated by, five, uh, by uh, serotonin and PI3 kinase. Once they're active, they form aggregates and they bind to CPE site on dormant mRNAs. They recruit um, poly-A polymerase and elongation of poly-A tail happens and dormant mRNAs are now, uh, can now, uh, you know, are active, they're not dormant anyway, and they can, they can be uh, recognized by ribosomes and they can be translated. So he, this is what we call local protein synthesis. It's a protein th synthesis and the translation of these mRNAs locally at these synapses. And you know, one of, you know, these mRNAs that uh, their translation is activated by, you know, CPEP, and, which are um, themselves activated by serotonin and uh, PI3, phosphorus site 3 kinase, some of those mRNAs encode some genes which are important for maintaining or, or stabilizing and, and strengthening newly formed synaptic connections. For example, some of those proteins uh, that are encoded by these mRNAs are N-actin and uh, tubulin. <coughs> these are tubulin, um, you know, it's a monomer for microtubules. <clears throat> microtubules and you know microtubules is a structure in cytoskeleton uh, 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 cytoskeleton and you know they form a, a, a cytoskeleton here and they they help to stabilize this newly formed synaptic connection that's why we need the local protein synthesis of uh, and local translation of these mRNAs <clears throat> for stabilizing the long-term synaptic changes after 24 hours in the capture of long-term facilitation. It's so beautiful. It's fantastic. Actually, uh, you know, uh, yeah, never mind. Uh, so this is it. This is, this is why we need local protein synthesis for maintaining the structural changes as a result of synaptic plasticity a long-term synaptic fa uh, facilitation after 24 hours. Okay, now <clears throat> let's talk about, well, uh, classical conditioning. I promised uh, that I'm going to explain classical conditioning at the end of this lecture. Let us talk about it. Uh, let's actually show the next slide. Let me, let me show you this slide. I'm going to explain it. Uh, with this. Well, <clears throat> the concept of classical conditioning, uh, first we know that classical conditioning is one of the uh, most famous uh, subtypes of implicit memories, non-declarative ones, and the concept of classical conditioning was first introduced by a Russian physiologist uh, called uh, Pavlov, and uh, what is, and he, you know, um, he came up with the idea of classical conditioning with his experiments, um, uh, in his experiments with dogs. So in classical conditioning, <clears throat> like in sensitization, you know, I told you that in sensitization we have two types of stimulus or, or stimuli. We have uh, a, a mild or a weak one, like that tactile shock to the siphon of the aplasia, and we have an intense one. We have a scary one, a very strong um, stimulus, which is, for example, the uh, like uh, that electric shock 
to the tail. And in classical conditioning, we again have those two types of stimulations. We have a conditioned stimulus, which is our uh, weaker stimulus, actually, like a tone, uh, a beam of light, or uh, you know, a tactile touch, for example. And we have an unconditioned stimulus, which is our strong stimulus, and it can be represented by food, by uh, electric shock, for example. And for example, you know, in this case, uh, food represents a very, uh, is a very strong stimulus for dogs. So uh, what we do in classical conditioning, in applying classical conditioning, sorry, inducing classical conditioning, what we do is that we pair these two uh, types of stimulations together. We uh, pair the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, and we see an unconditioned response. The unconditioned response, such as the salvation, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, not salvation. Uh, like this response, you know, it's it's uh, the unconditioned response is innate, and it doesn't require uh, relearning. It's innate. It's uh, natural. After repetitive uh, or repeating this pairing of conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus, what happens is that the conditioned stimulus becomes an anticipatory signal for the unconditioned stimulus. So when we pair this, uh, you know, uh, bell, in this a particular tone, for example, with food, and we repeat this pairing, what happens is that whenever the animal uh, hears that uh, tone, that particular tone, it uh, actually shows the unconditioned response. So that tone, that a specific condition of stimulus, becomes an anticipatory signal. Uh, for the unconditioned stimulus. And now I want to talk about classical conditioning in aplasia and its uh, cellular mechanisms. So classical conditioning in aplasia is that, well, <clears throat> uh, so we have, you know, in the, in the very first experiment, we do not pair those two types of stimulations. We don't pair the unconditioned stimulus with uh, conditioned stimulus. What, what happens is that when we don't pa uh, pair, you know, we first have uh, 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 an electric shock to the tail, okay, that unconditioned stimulus, and we wait, and for example, for two minutes, for example, and we uh, shock the siphon. Not shock, but we, we, we stimulate the siphon. And the tactile stimulus of the siphon represents that mild, weak, unconditioned, uh, sorry, conditioned stimulus. And then we wait again, and we stimulate the, uh, the tail again. Actually, we don't see, and we measure the cell responses, uh, like sensitization and habituation, no change, almost no change in the action potentials in si uh, siphon sensory neuron. And a gill motor neuron EPSB is nothing changed. Actually, it's uh, even smaller. We don't see any sensitization or any unconditioned response. We are looking for an unconditioned response, and the unconditioned response, in this case, in classical conditioning in aplasia, is a strong gill withdrawal. But here, we don't see that because we didn't pair those two uh, types of stimulus, stimuli. And that pairing, you know, pairing condition and unconditioned stimulus or stimuli is the essence of classical conditioning. In the second experiment, we actually pair these two types of stimulations. We first uh, touch the siphon densely and immediately pre, uh, prior to that, we shock the tail. We wait for five minutes. We do this experiment one more time. We repeat it. We shock the, we, we touch the siphon, and we immediately after that, I explained immediately prior uh, to that, but you know, 
sorry for that. Immediately after the touch to the, uh, to the siphon, we uh, stimulate the tail. And then when we measure the cell responses, we have an, uh, an increase in the, in the amplitude of EPSP. After re repeating and after training or after repeating uh, the, uh, you know, pairing these two types of stimulations. Um, so let's see what happens at these synapses and why this pairing uh, is going to increase the EPSB in the trained animal, in, in modern ones in, of the trained animal. What happens is that when we shock the siphon or, or stimulate the siphon first, you know, uh, calcium gets in as a result of that uh, stimulation in the terminal, axonal terminal of the siphon. The calcium comes in, it activates calcium chondroitin, which I talked about it in the last lecture, in the, in the final lecture of uh, in uh, biosignaling, biosignaling 3. So it activates calcium calmodulin. Calcium calmodulin uh, primes adenine cyclase. And by priming, I mean that it, uh, you know, it prepares the adenine cyclase, and so it primes the adenine cyclase, cyclase to be more responsive to the uh, <clears throat> to the serotonin, okay? So, calcium gets in as a result of uh, the sh uh, stimulation of the siphon. Calcium gets in, uh, calcium activates calcium calmodulin. Calcium calmodulin uh, primes or uh, prepares the analyzed cyclase. So that the analyzed cyclase uh, responds vi more vigorously and produces more CAMP as a result of the, uh, the uh, you know, application of serotonin. So we need the application of serotonin. What we do is that we uh, shock the tail immediately after uh, shocking or stimulating the siphon. So we stimulate the siphon, the analyzed cycle is just primed and you know, it's going to be more responsive to the, uh, to the serotonin. It's going to produce more CAMP when serotonin is, is received by the cell, by the sensory neurons, ax uh, axonal terminals of the sensory neurons. And we immediately, when we immediately shock the tail, the serotonin gets in, and analyzed uh, cyclist is now primed, is more responsive to serotonin. It produces more CAMP, and more CAMP will activate more uh, protein kinase enzymes, recruit, uh, they, protein kinase enzymes, you know, they, protein kinase A um, enzymes, they re uh, recruit more synaptic vesicles, release, uh, they, they augment the uh, transmitter release, and that's why we see uh, an enhanced uh, response, an enhanced gill withdrawal reflex, and an increase, we, we see an increase in the amplitude of EPSB in motor neurons. So that's it, that's it all. So the essence here, of classical conditioning in aplasia is that we first prime the analyzed cyclase in the axonal terminal of sensory neurons. So it, it is more responsive to serotonin and immediately after it is primed, we apply serotonin by shocking the tail. And that's how repeating this uh, pairing of these two stimulations, we get uh, a trained classically conditioned animal or aplasia. Uh, the analyzed cyclase acts as a, uh, a coincidence detector, actually, and uh, it detects the, the uh, temporal order of these two types of stimuli. If we stimulate the tail first, like in the unpaired pathway, nothing happens because the analyzed cyclase in the sensory neuron is not primed uh, to, respond, to respond more vigorously uh, to the serotonin. But when we pair, uh, when we prime it first, 
Uh, when we stimulate the siphon and we prime the adenylate cyclase, it, it responds more vigorously to the serotonin as a result, uh, which is sec secreted as a result of that uh, electric shock to the tail. So that was the uh, classical conditioning in aplasia. The last uh, point of all of these lectures on implicit memory that I want to mention here is a very beautiful uh, quote or name given to all of these mechanisms by Dr. Eric Kendall, who discovered almost all of these, uh, you know, mechanisms. And that's a dialogue between genes and synapses. All of those mechanisms involved in habituation, sensitization, even classical conditioning, they're just a dialogue between genes and synapses. There's a back and forth communication and interaction between synapses and genes. So you can see that here it's a very oversimplified picture of whatever I talked about in these lectures. We apply serotonin uh, <clears throat> at one synapse. Some proteins are activated there. They go back and uh, signal, uh, they send some signals to the uh, genes in the nucleus. Those genes are activated, the transcription of those genes are activated, is activated, and those genes uh, encode new pr you know, proteins uh, which are important for growth, and those proteins are, you know, get back to the synapses from the nucleus. So we have uh, some proteins uh, activated at the synapse, they go up to the nu uh, nucleus and uh, up to the uh, genes, and we have some new proteins from the genes back to the synapses. So it's basically a dialogue, a back and forth communication between synapses and genes. That's it. Okay, so that was uh, the final video, uh, the final lecture uh, in the series of lectures on uh, implicit memories. Uh, you know, I explain habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning. I elaborate on some of the mechanisms which are involved in uh, you know, maintaining the structural changes in, in um, sensitization. And so that was it. Uh, thank you so much for watching these videos. Uh, well, the next lecture series, which I, uh, you know, I think there are going to be five videos, five lectures, are going to be on uh, explicit memories. I'm going to explain, uh, well, uh, memory formation in hippocampus, the induction and expression of long-term uh, potentiation in different uh, pathways uh, of the hippocampal circuitry like Schaefer collateral pathway or perforant pathway and uh, mossy fiber, uh, fiber pathway. And uh, I'm going to also talk about the microcircuits of the brain and the microcircuits of the hippocampus and the role in, uh, <clears throat> in the memory formation and consolidation of memory in hippocampus. Thank you so much for watching these videos and bye.